Welcome to MyPersonalFootballCoach.com's Soccer Player Development Podcast. Discover all the secrets, hints and tips about soccer player development and soccer coaching from some of the leading figures in world soccer. Here's your host, Saul Isaacson Hurst. Hi guys, welcome back to another show. Um, really privileged to have a fantastic guest this week, someone who is a real innovator. Uh, I don't use that term lightly. Someone really helped change the game of coaching in England, uh, really helped revolutionise the way we we we, uh, we 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 coach players, and really has has had a lasting effect on the game here. It's uh, Simon Clifford, who was. Um, uh, previously owner of Brazilian soccer schools, uh, worked at Southampton as well, and uh, also uh, owned Garston Football Club, semi-professional club. Um, really interesting story here. Like you know, I was just really captivated with someone who you know um, saw that maybe there was a, a gap in terms of way we were we were we were coaching players in this country, we weren't giving them enough technical coaching. Uh, Travel to Brazil, uh, learnt from some of the best out there. Uh, he base also, you know, he, you know, he, 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 you know, he debunks the 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 myth that you know players just all learn on the street in Brazil. You know, it's a lot of organised football in Brazil uh, in youth clubs and uh, in academies. Uh, most of these players are involved in these sorts of these sorts of uh, these sorts of clubs. And just more interestingly, just the way they they coach the players there. You know, lots of technical work, lots of isolated work, lots of real quality in depth. Um, work with the ball, uh, longer sessions, obviously small-sided games, and uh, he went over there. He saw that and brought that back over here and implemented it, and and uh, he got a lot of uh, exposure in it. So a, a fantastic story, uh, someone who who really inspires me, um, and uh, someone you know that this this really you know I took so much from this, and uh, always been intrigued about Simon and the work he, he's done. So. I know this is one you're you're going to enjoy, and it's definitely one uh, not to be missed. Uh, big announcement from the my personal football coach side of things. Uh, proud to announce West Bromwich Albion uh, now another uh, club partnership. Uh, this Category One uh, Top Academy is going to be utilised in the my personal football coach app. Obviously now during lockdown, a uh, way to support their players with quality, world class learning. Um, players can upload their own videos, they can share and they can obviously log into the back end, uh, they can set the players' challenges and uh, all the coaches get access to the coaches' pass. So really excited to have this club partnership. Obviously they join Arsenal, Wolves and Middlesbrough as other Cat One academies, some of the best academies in the country utilising uh, my personal football coach. And you know, the last week or so we've had clubs from Canada, America, England, uh, New Zealand and Australia sign up as well. And Dubai as well. Uh, big shout out to the Dubai Irish um, for joining us. So listen, if you're interested in how my personal football coach can take your club to the next level, it's the it's the number one choice in the world. There, there's no one competing with it. Nothing gives you uh, that world class online access with my background, obviously, and and obviously you know that's why the the top clubs in the world are choosing it. Just drop me a DM uh, and we can set you up a demo. Uh, but without further ado, let's get into the show. Simon Clifford, welcome to the show. Thanks, all. Can you just give us a brief uh, outline of your, your your playing and coaching journey up to this point, please? Yep. Playing-wise, I played football in school from about what we now call under-9s. I played for the under-11s team. Uh, when I was an under-11, I was banned for a year because I didn't wow. like to lose and would kick off at teachers even. And uh, I was a bit of a young Roy Keane. Carried on playing in school until what we now call year nine. And... That year transitioned into athletics and became quite serious about running, um, distance running. I ended up by about 17, 18, I was running 80, 90 miles a week and became pretty reasonable at it. Didn't engage with football again until my degree, which was sports in Leeds, and didn't play again after sort of stopping in year nine until 19. 94 when I played for Tadcaster Albion Reserves against Eccles Hill. So I was out of it for nearly a decade. On the degree side, carried on studying, and um, but playing wise, I stopped for that whole period. So tell us about your coaching journey then. Tell us about how that 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 started and went. So 
uh, upon graduating, I took a job as a teacher and began coaching the football teams within the school, uh, beginning with under nines. Then we started in under eights, the tens and elevens, and threw myself into it. And I think very much football had been my first love. And um, in fact, when I'd sort of veered off from it in the middle of, of high school, it was really because I was I was a bit of a, a dribbler. I liked that side of the game. It wasn't too much encouraged. And I ended up getting fed up with, I suppose, teachers being on my back. They were probably right to be on my back, but um, I fell out of love with it, but rediscovered my love, I think, on my degree. And then in a teaching sense, and I wanted the best for the kids that I worked with. So I started accessing resources that were available at the time uh, that I thought would help them in the coaching. And my degree had been very good for giving me a, a grounding in that we must put skill first. And I didn't see that in the the sort of way coaching courses were run and all the rest of it at that time. We'd had the FA prelim introduced to us on our degree. And when I saw how coaching was done, it, it didn't seem to fit with what I was seeing on the academic side. And so in school, I was looking for the kids for something different. So I got videos on IACT, um, looked at some stuff from Italy. And then I'd been obsessed with the Brazilian national team from, from way back, maybe from the 82 World Cup. And I wanted to get some resources as to how Brazil trained. In fact, the first session I ever put on in my life, coaching session, it, it wasn't actually coaching. I stuck on uh, the BBC documentary Boys from Brazil, John Motson narrating. Played it to the kids in this classroom. I said, that's how we're going to play. This was on a Tuesday. This, that's how we're going to play. We're going to start on Thursday. But I didn't have too much idea as to how Brazil trained or anything else. I wrote to our FA. Uh, they didn't have too much information either and, and suggested to me the Brazilian one may be naturals. And I was very lucky, fortunate, in the, in the midst of all this, maybe I've been teaching two years, um, Janinho signs for Middlesbrough. And I was on that straight away, contacted the club, wanted to know if there was a way to speak to him, get hold of him. And uh, so, yeah, that led, that led me into this interaction with him that began um, the start of 1996. And then to, and then to tell us more, because obviously that grew into something, you know, quite spectacular, didn't it? So it just says, go through it just briefly and we'll go into a bit more detail. Just yeah, so, so Janini and I became really good friends. He hadn't met up with too many other people in England. He couldn't speak English very well, nor his family. His mum and dad was with him. I think because I was a school teacher, his dad liked the fact of getting a relationship with me. Um, his dad wasn't too keen on him I, I don't think sort of socialising with, with the other footballers at that time and so I'd coach on an evening in Leeds um, with the children that I worked with I'd get in the car, I'd drive to Ingleby Barwick where Janino lived and I'd sit there till about 11 o'clock at night and I'd quiz him as to how players in Brazil were developed um, I'd write things down, I'd go home look at it, I'd be back the next night. And this went on for months. And eventually I said to him, I'd like to actually go out to Brazil and see firsthand. He talked to me about this game, Football de Salon, or Futsal. And I'd never heard of this. I was, subs I was subscribed and I was in a, a fair few coaching associations here in England at the time, the Association of Football Coaches and Teachers that were backed up by Adidas. And a few more, I went to seminars. But I'd never heard of, of um, Futsal and I couldn't find anybody else that had so I said I wanted to go out there and see it. I said I'd like to meet some of the, the great players that inspired me, Pele, Zico, Kareka, people like that. His dad said to me, these guys are very busy. My son's the number 10 of Brazil. He said, we haven't met these guys. But I, I persisted. I got a fax machine, faxed the Brazilian embassy in London, um, started writing letters. Not much of this worked, but I, I, I set myself, I thought, I'm going to go out to Brazil and look at this game. And, I want to meet some of these guys and see how they thought they'd see, listen to them tell me how they'd developed. So um, I set up this trip. The BBC ended up coming out with me from uh, Leeds. I was still a teacher at the time and didn't really have any money. So I borrowed five five thousand pounds to make this trip and went off in the summer of 97. Stayed initially in a in like a mini stadium at the University of Sao Paulo where Sao Paulo Football Club is one of their training bases and it, 
it was pretty uh, Spartan, a um, bit like a prison cell type of thing, but a little bit bigger. There was cock- cockroaches everywhere. But I was in football heaven because so I'd walk out from the, the sort of dormitory I was in on the morning. There was only me staying in this stadium, and there'd be people training, exercises, movements, drills, passes that I'd never seen. It was extraordinary, and then on an evening. I see people outside playing uh, futsal, get talking to people. The the newspapers in Brazil took an interest in what I was doing and um, that got some sort of well-known players, the ones that I'd, I'd been after, it got them interested in talking to me. Um, so Zico, I end up meeting up with, spend time with him at his place in Rio. Correcor invites me over to his football centre in um, uh, another part of Sao Paulo. I want to meet Ronaldo's first coach. I want to see the scruffiest sort of street corner clubs. Wanted to see amateur football. So I had a video camera, a dictaphone, and I went everywhere, but spent most of my time um, with Sao Paulo Football Club and looking at them from what we call the Denti Late Age Group, which is under 12, right up to the juniors. Uh, the, so the team before the first team. I was interested how those stru- clubs were structured. Janino, before I went out, said to me, he'd got quite, he, he'd, he'd been brought into England um, on a record transfer for a Brazilian. He was, it was the highest fee ever play, paid for a footballer from Brazil at the time in 95. Doesn't sound a lot today, but when Middlesbrough, who were, you know, Middlesbrough had a fair bit of money at, at that moment, they, was, they were outspending some of the biggest teams in the Premier League. Paid £4.75 million pounds for him. He was Brazil's number 10. Was South American Player of the Year. And he came to Middlesbrough maybe four times the wages he'd had in Sao Paulo. And I think he expected four times the structure in terms of the training centre, the coaching. And the, in that time in the Premier League, there wasn't very much. And he'd say to me some days, is Manchester United even the same as this? That we're hardly training. There's the places where we're training exercises we're doing there's no coaching and um, he said to me in Brazil you'll find even this the smallest street corner club has a better structure and I thought that's a wild statement to make and it was only going out there that um, I saw what he meant and I could only see say getting to Sao Paulo football club at that time was a bit like it reminded me of them kids on the old Gene Wilder film that walked into Charlie in the chocolate factory it was just incredible in terms of the nutrition the psychological support um, the facilities, the detail in the work, it was amazing. And so, met let's, with let's, 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 let, let's, let's talk a bit about that then, Santos. I mean, I don't because you're, you're getting quite depth, it's quite interesting. So I'm, I'm already captivated because I've always been, uh, you know, at all, and you're really interested in Brazilian football. So, tell us about when, when you said you first went there and you said uh, you, you looked in there and you saw those drills and those movements and stuff. What, what were they doing? You're a coach, so you know, to tell us what sort of stuff were they doing in, in, the, in the club there in the academy? Um, I think the big difference, it was Sao Paulo Football Club, and the, the, the big difference, I think, was the use of the ball. We didn't, in England at that time, you know, if you looked at a, you looked at a session, you know, most of the sessions were sort of uh, X's and O's, and you maybe have one ball and they're working on a phase of play or some sort of gay element, element, people were out with the ball. I'd see age groups at San Paolo just out with the ball between two of them, you know, in, in rows, two, 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 doing that for two hours. Uh, stuff that we'd have maybe frowned on. So, so like what's doing, like just pass and receiving technical work? Passing and receiving techniques technical. for two, for two, <clears> for two <throat> hours doing it. Not yeah. changing the exercise that much, but drilling down on technique. Um, People doing, you know, when I when I came back and I started doing what we'd now call rondos, I had people from local sort of pro clubs in Yorkshire coming down and say, well, that's just piggy in the middle. Yeah. But all right, doing rondos at the time, which weren't, um, but a lot of individual work with the ball on their own. And later on, I got working with some clubs in England that got me down Middlesbrough through Dave Parnaby. Everton had me working there for a bit. Um, Colin Harvey and Tosh Farrell, early advocates of what I was trying to do. And I would say, this is how they're working in Brazil. And this, you know, uh, say they'd say, well, okay, we could put that in the warm up. But in Brazil, it was actually the whole session. And I suppose mm. 
when we talk about isolated practice now and in the last years, you know, the last decade, you know, I read sort of, you know, some people against that. It's the basis. It's the basis of football. And that's what it was there. And you show me still players that are more technically adept than South Americans. I don't think there is. So their system, actually, when I came away, was very simple. But it was very different to how we were going about it. And I, even in the warm-up, you know, the sort of warm-up that we would, the warm-ups that we would have now, the last sort of two, three years in the Premier League, you know, we didn't have even dynamic stretching in in essence, you know, in the way we sort of warmed up in, in the Premier League, even in that uh, in that period, everything was the the warm up, the the, the stretching warm up they did with the the movements and clap. It was almost like a dance. Um, but the use of the ball and the ball was king. I got playing with some, I got in with some sort of families of Brazilian national team players who were maybe playing under twenty ones, kids who were involved at São Paulo, and I got playing with some of these lads on a Sunday and all the rest of it. And I know I noticed the the shouts as we were playing. Boa, boa bola, boa dribbles, good dribble, good pass. And in England, all you would get was, you know, obviously, get rid of it. Oh, Smash all of that sort of thing. <laughs> yeah, it was just, it was so different, it was untrue. By the end of that trip, I thought, this is a disgrace. This is a national disgrace. We're importing players in. And I'd got I'd got friends, good friends with another player at Middlesbrough, a great lad, who uh, Michael Cox in Zonal Marking, I think he calls him the first deep lying, true deep lying midfielder of the of, of deep deep lying playmaker of the Premier League era, Emerson, who'd been Portuguese player at the year at Porto. We brought him from there, but he was Brazilian. Had come to Portugal sort of early on, got a. Portuguese password. We brought this lad in, and in a different way, he impressed me football-wise as, as much as Janino, and he was different. Again, he'd come out of he'd come out of football the salon, but he was night and day to players in England at that time. Yes, we'd had, you know, Roy Keane, an unbelievable player and competitor. Uh, you know, the end of the nineties, you're getting Vieira in the Premier League, but this lad, in his touch and in his range of passing. And in Brazil, I just saw there was innumerable of these players and the the focus was the ball. So at the end of that trip, I was quite happy going into that trip to carry on being a school teacher. Um, by the end of it, what I'd witnessed had shocked me to such an extent. I was in a, in a, in a, a position as a sort of England loving guy that we'd not qualified for the 1994 World Cup. You know, we'd had that documentary, um, you know, Graham Taylor was a fantastic manager and man. And but that documentary on, on the sort of coaching setup that we had at the time, it, you know, even though there was little bits, you sort of got the impression this isn't all that serious. When I'd left football as a, you know, uh, 13, 14 year old and got into running, I didn't leave football because football wasn't that serious, but I was quite serious about it. I uh, I was very serious about it, and I liked people who were serious in things. When I got into the running, a, an individual sport, I became I wasn't that good at that at the beginning, but I became reasonable by training, and I, I got very serious about it. I saw people in Brazil that were serious about football, and I came back and I thought, right. I didn't have any particular plan how to do it, but I thought I'm going to leave teaching and get people training like this. Uh, I felt like I had to do it, and yeah, so that was the start of you know what became these soccer, these soccer schools and all the rest of it. You talked about it briefly there. You mentioned it about the isolated work, and it's you know very topical. But I mean, because a lot of people just think Brazilians, you know, just innately have you know great technique with the ball, but it's just the cultural thing, isn't it? They just spend time with the ball, and like you say, even in those. Academy environments. So there's there's an, a a um, Cruzeiro uh, run a private school here in Phuket. Actually, I've I've visited the other day and they got Brazilian coaches and they're just t just some technical. The day before, I was training a day, and it's just all technical work. And the boys, you know, so even in those structured environments, there's very you know 
ball in the you know individual orientated and it's, it's interesting isn't it because almost still now we have a problem in this country with you know people think oh why are we not just playing a game why are we spending time you know developing these and we're almost doing less technical work now <laughs> in these academies than we were now and you're talking about because it used to maybe just be passing 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 but now it's like you know oh well just put them in the game and get into it what's your, what's your thoughts on that yeah i'm con- completely in accord with you and um couldn't under you know struggle to understand anybody that can't uh, that can't see that uh, the individual the technique is the basis of everything whether you're going into tactics whatever you're going into um, is impossible if you haven't got mastery of the if you haven't got mastery of the ball when you go into them things you'll find them that much easier and you'll be able to do uh, far more complex things team wise if you have got mastery and th- that was the way I saw them them approach it so again. You know, at the time, San Paolo Football Club had beaten um, AC Milan. They were they were world club champions when I was there, or had been just the year before. And right up to the, you know, you had uh, Denti Late, first age group under 12, Infantile, Juvenile, Junior. They work in two year age bands, so two years, two years. So so right up to the sort of 20, Denti Late is under 12, right up to the 20s, 21s. The sessions had a heavy technique focus. When you talk them under 12s and 14s, the, se- the session was just nearly all technique. It was stuff that we, we wouldn't have done and still don't. Um, and now I'm not sure today if, you know, there's a friend of mine was out in, you know, working in Brazil and then he's, he's, he's got a, a keen eye on what's happening there at the minute. I don't know if they're going to European uh, right now. I think countries like Urugu- Uruguay, uh, it's still very ball orientated and Argentina. Well, this is the basic of it, basics of it. Zico said to me when I was with him, up to 14, just ball, ball and ball. <laughs> and that was what I saw across um, Brazil. And it was what I tried to bring. It's what I tried to bring back. With what did they have? Um, did they, what were the young? Did, did they, did, was 12 the first age group they had in the academy? So? Yes. Yeah. So then... Pre that, it's just all street football type stuff like that. Street football, but I'm trying not to name drop, but Rivellino said to me, people haven't played in the street in Brazil for 30 years. And in the favelas, people maybe are playing in the street, the rest of them not. And there is, you know, there's so many places to play. Um, We used to talk years ago about Brazilian players coming out, you know, developing on the beaches and, and all that type of thing. I think that was just because journalists from this country or even whoever it was, our sometimes the national team goes, you go to Rio and you come from the airport and you see all them people on the beach. That isn't the reality of most of Brazil. And obviously, Sao Paulo itself is uh, 90k from the beach or something like that. So you've got futsal courts, you've got other areas. Um, the football pitches are everywhere. So what Janino said to me, even the smallest street corner club, if you went away before the before Denti late, before the club, the club takes players in, the the sort of the grassroots teams, if you like, that are working on a patch of grass or they're working, you know, they had a bag of balls and the session was at the beginning of the session it was a ball each. I I. I my Brazilian soccer schools was based on more or less the rhythm of the sessions that I saw there, which was if it was a two hour session, they did train at times for two hours. It was more or less 40 minutes individual with the ball. That's exaggerated as to, as to what I saw with some, but I was mentored a little bit by a guy called Walter Gamma. And he was a coach across Brazil and then ended up um, coaching the Jamaican team that qualified I think for whichever World Cup it was uh, with Rennie Simones and Volta took me on stayed at his house and I, I, I copied a lot a lot from his sessions but maybe 40 minutes individual with the ball stroke individual stroke paired because first you with the ball then going off pass receive the basic passes the basic receives then doing them with movement so individual or paired 40 minutes then 40 minutes group work whether it's rondos or passing drills and exercises and the last 40 minutes of course we need it the chaos the play where you put these things into 
you put the stuff that you're, you're getting an individual into practice. And I'd, it was an intoxicating mix that if I, if I was coaching sort of groups today and teams, I, I don't think I would veer too much from that. So I think, you know, when people go on about isolated practice, what are they thinking? That anybody's, you know, going to be stood with a ball and do nothing else but that? No. Football's a chaotic, multi... <laughs> Oops, Sorry. there you go. <laughs> Good timing. <laughs> Foot <laughs> Football's a multi-dimensional, chaotic, uh, random game. And, you know, that was clear from the yeah. beginning. But you need the time with the ball on your own. You need to nail that st stuff down. And not just, you know, moves to beat or that type of thing. Controlling it, passing it, shooting it, all of it. But for that, it needs time with you and the ball. Um, the last years... I've got working with all manner of wonderful players at a professional level and 23s at the level before that. And as you'll know, obviously you can get to, you can get to those realms and areas, but people might not still have what I'd call the basic techniques, mm -hmm. which you can work on with them at that age, but you can get it all when you're a kid. And I think it, it should be that we get that first. So, Dintessa, you come back from uh, Brazil and you're on a mission. So how do you then go about changing the, the game in England? Yeah, so came back. Um, the BBC, who I'd persuaded to go with me, they made a documentary which ended up being called A Whole New Ball Game, which was focused on futsal. And they put out, upon my return to Brazil, when I'm, I'm still a teacher, they put out clips from this documentary and they go on breakfast news and maybe the lunchtime BBC news. And Arsene Wenger, through Claire Tomlinson, who was his PR person at the minute, gets in touch and wanted to know what I was doing. Uh, Glenn Hoddle, the England manager, gets in touch through John Gorman, his assistant, rings the BBC and says, how can I get in touch with this guy? John Gorman comes to meet me in Leeds on behalf of Glenn Hoddle and says... Some of this stuff you're doing is fantastic. We've got Graham Lasso playing at fullback or wing back. We'd like him to learn a trick or two. Would you mind working with him? And I'm thinking, well, I'm just a school teacher, really. This is a bit. Dave Parnaby gets in touch with me from Middlesbrough. He was England under 15s manager when we had the schoolboy ESF 18. Then he's academy director. The, the chart of equality has just come in. So Dave said to me, could you come down and do some? We've got to do in service with our coaches 40 hours a year. Would you come and put a day on for us? As I say, Colin Harvey at Everton, Alan Irving at Newcastle, Tony Carr at West Ham. And I'm developing this little school in Leeds that was, the kids were coming for free initially. I just coached them for free. It was an offshoot of what I was doing in the school. And I thought, well, if I need, if I leave teaching, I'm going to have to fund myself somehow. Um, so I started charging the kids for the soccer school, not very much, it was just a pound an hour. And people kept were coming down to my school. The teams, that I, the clubs that asked me to do some coaching with them or in service, um, I asked them, could my lads play a match against them? So these, the, these kids who, who'd been working with me in the first soccer school have now been with me for a couple of years by maybe... 1998, the sort of time Giannini or come, came down since then, and we got reasonable results against some of these uh, professional clubs, and I think it was also the way that we'd played, and so people started taking a bit of note of that, more TV comes down and films us, I'd say our kids at the time, I was thinking about it for whatever reason yesterday, but the first group that we had at Brazilian soccer schools they ended up with a different technique, I think, to anybody else in England at the time. We might not have been the best players, but we passed it differently. We caressed it a bit different. I think people saw that on TV and all the rest of it. Year after, I get exposure. Michael Owen soccer skills. People to do with Michael Owen approached me to do a project with him. I wrote a book with him. I did a TV series that went out BBC every Friday. And so the interest in what I was doing was getting bigger and bigger. I'm talking about futsal, I'm talking about technique. And people want to have a school like I'm doing in Leeds. I didn't really know exactly how I would 
opened more schools and somebody suggested to me franchising. So looked into that, not in a particularly big way, cobbled some contracts together for the people who did, made it very cheap. It was like 500 quid to start, that was all. 1,000 quid a year after that. And within no time, I've got 30 soccer schools across the country. Lego then come in, the toy company. Snickers approached, approached us. I mean, Lego offered a million pounds to sponsor this vision I had for the soccer schools. Snickers, wow. the chocolate people, they offered to double it. McDonald's were in the thing as well, but I went with Lego. And that gave me, uh, again, I was very, very lucky, but that gave me a, a contract with them and some sort of basis how I could really roll these things out. So the, the school spread, you know, even further across the UK. Then we got, started to go overseas about the year 2000, 2001, uh, United States, California, Bangkok, Singapore, Hong Kong and Canada and, and on and you know, eventually they ended up on every continent. Wow. So then, that's interesting, isn't it? Because you're almost like um, you're a pioneer in terms of the Brazilian way, but also becoming a businessman. I think about this a lot because obviously I get a lot of people asking me about how I create my first football coach and that sort of thing. How difficult was it dealing with that side of the business? I'm, my background is in teaching as well. I almost had to upskill myself. How difficult was it becoming a businessman as well as a coach stroke teacher and managing all of that? I think I, I always put the coach in first, which possibly early on didn't make me the best businessman. Um, and I wasn't, like you, I wasn't really trained in business or anything like that. I had to sort of work it out as I went along. My, my passion, like yours, came from the football. And I wanted to pass on these things I was learning. I felt a, an almost evangelical zeal to do it and then it, the second thing came well how do I find a way to do that uh, how can you know how can I fund spreading this out so I wasn't at the beginning looking to make profit or any of that in fact Brian Marwood who was a friend of mine he's now at Man City running the City Football Group Brian at the time was with Nike and Brian was one of my first backers even before Lego and um, I, I offered to Brian to do the schools, that which I ended up selling to Lego for a million pounds. I said to Brian, before Lego, I said, look, I'll put all these schools out, make the ball for it, which Mitre ended up doing. That came from Glenn Hoddle. Mitre made, made the first sort of futsal ball in England. Uh, Glenn Hoddle put me onto them. But I said, I said to Brian, I'll roll these schools out. I said, just match my teaching wage, which was about 15,000 a year at the time. And I said, I'll just do all of this with Nike. And that was all I wanted. I was. I'd have been quite happy to just, you know, pay the bills and all the rest of it, but pass this message on and coach football this way. But okay, you go on, you get a bit better at business, you understand it, and and then it, it grows. I think the, I didn't find it too much of a problem juggling it until I start something else called Soccer Tots because I was very, if I had my time again, I wouldn't, I would, I would, I would approach doing the soccer talk slightly differently, um, but I wanted England to get an edge on other countries, as I saw it. My soccer schools had started very early anyway. We started at five six, which wasn't the norm back in the day, and I thought we can take that younger. I was looking at Serena Williams and, and Vanessa in, in tennis. I was looking at Tiger Woods, Boris Becker when he'd started. I thought if we could get the technique nailed down even earlier, so this soccer tots thing I started, that ended up in about 20, 30 countries. Then I buy a football club in Leeds. Um, there was nine below the Premier League, but I had a sort of project for that. And in the midst of all of this, Sir Clive Woodward approached me to be his right-hand man at Southampton. And that's when it got a bit difficult for me because I had, you know, I was making DVDs before YouTube, I was, I was just seemed to be doing everything. And I had a little bit of a plan. Soccer Tots was part of it and then this club, but then things from the outside were coming to me, like the Southampton thing. And that period I started to find juggling all that I'd built difficult. You've got people ringing you 24 hours a day because you've got guys in Australia, you've got guys in mm. uh, United States, you've got 
I'm, I'm at Southampton. I'm then trying to also run the football club that we've. It was. Then it became very chaotic and difficult. So to that then, the Southampton um, gig with uh, Five Woodward. How did that come about? And what exactly were you doing? Yes. So, Clive approached me at the end of 2004. Um, he, Clive Woodward, wrote, uh, so wrote a couple of emails and. Um, I was that much sort of a man on a mission at the time. I wasn't even that keen on, on meeting up with Clive, not that I didn't like him or anything, or I probably thought meeting him would be a distraction. Uh, in the back of my mind, I don't know why I thought he would be meeting me, but uh, um, he wrote a couple of emails and I thought, okay, I, I'd read his book, uh, Winning. Um, I thought, okay, we'll, we'll, I'll meet up and have a chat. So he came to Leeds and met me for dinner. He st stayed in Leeds for a couple of days, but met me. He asked if he could come for a couple of days with me. I think there's that why, that's why I wasn't sure at the beginning. I would have met him, of course, but I think I, I kind of thought, well, what's this going to be all about? But the night he met me was a year to the day that he'd won the Rugby World Cup, and that probably stuck with me a bit. He took me out for a dinner in Leeds. At that time, Another name dropped, but I had Socrates with me as well. It was the former Brazil captain who was with me at Garforth. So it was me, yeah. Clive and Socrates and my dad who I brought to talk to Socrates while I talked to Clive. Clive was very insistent on seeing me. And I was like, I think I had so many things on. I thought, what's this all about? This the rugby guy's coming to see me. He wants to be with me two days. Uh, that was my life at the minute. It was, you know, things coming from everywhere. We had Todd Grip came down in the same period sent by Sven Goran Eriksson it was a, wow. a mad mad period but Clive came spent a couple of days with me I from that dinner and the next day I did actually get very interested in, in him because I think on a tactical side football wise he said some things to me that, and suggested some things that I'd thought and believed in that I'd never heard anybody else in football say and so his brain interested me a little bit and he went away we keep emailing talking meet up again gets my wife down to meet him and his wife and eventually says i'm going to southampton football club he'd been offered a job from the fa by mark palios who was chief executive at the time a performance director and didn't take that because he wanted to actually coach and manage in football said football had been his first love He'd met the chairman of Southampton and things had progressed and they'd offered him a, a role there to initially come in and sort of learn the ropes, but in time, manage the football team with a coach. And he said the reason he'd come to me, he'd been around the world looking for a coach to go on this sort of thing with him, journey, and what he'd read and watched and what he was seeing from me, he sort of wanted that to be me. So this period of talking to me went on for quite a few months, asked me to come with him. Initially at Southampton, him and I together would have the reserve team, but in time we'd be, you know, possibly bizarre though it sounds now, we'd have been in charge of the first team. A bit of a jump. I at the time had just got my first promotion at Garford. It's a non-league team. Clive's come from rugby. But I could see if we had the reserves for a year or so and cut our teeth with that, I thought, well, maybe it would have a chance of, of you know, maybe we could do something. Also, working individually with the players, I'd be doing. Um, Southampton had a great crop at the time. And so after a few times of saying no, I said to him, I would do it. So punitively, we were given the titles performance director, Clive and myself, head of sports science. But essentially, we were the manager and coach in waiting. Um, and getting down there was so many positives. I got to work with wonderful players. We had Gareth Bale in our reserve team. We gave him his debut for the reserves. Adam Lalana, who was already in that. But the, the group of first-year scholars that I got and some second years to work with each morning, Clive and I were going to work them hard. We were going to work hard. That was, both of us had that in common. And I think, knowing the way Leeds United runs today, the, the sort of operation we, we were 
putting in place was a little little bit Bielsa-like in, in terms of the hours and I think even in terms of some of the some of the work and um, so we'd get the lads in early on the morning they were all staying at this thing that the, the, the chairman had bought he'd bought a sort of old guest house turned it into a lodgings it was called the lodge so Theo Walcott Nathan Dyer Martin Craney Dexter Blacksock David McGoldrick Matty Mills Leon Best couple more great young players they'd come with us on the morning we'd train at the club individual technique for an hour seven o'clock in the morning or maybe they'd, we'd get there at seven they'd be there maybe half past and at first they were a little bit well what on earth is this getting up at this time and all the rest of it I was also expecting them to train on an evening so if like when Theo broke through into the first team he was training with Harry at half ten he'd be training with me at seven o'clock and then on a the night we'd all get together I think it was called St Edward's or King Edward's School where the academy was and this same group some of who were in the first team they'd train on an evening again with me and we'd do futsal and stick music on they weren't that keen on that at first Nathan Dyer and Theo were particularly uh, but we got a vibe going and um, we got such a good little bond between us within maybe a month or so if one of them was injured they'd turn up just to stick the music on or to be part of it Leon Best had gather them all together in the morning get them out of bed it was good one of the happiest I suppose coaching times of my life sometimes a player would ring me in the afternoon like Bestie and he'd say can I do another session that would mean he was training four times and we'd just do individual technique and when I eventually left Southampton uh the effect we'd had on them, I think one thing that stands out to me is a little story. Maybe six, nine months later, I'll come on to why I left in it in a moment, but Nathan Dyer rang me. I said, I, um, he rang my office, missed, missed him, and I come in, I rang him, I said, how are you doing? He said, not, 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 not too good. I said, how come? I said, you scored last night, which I saw. Steve, Steve Cottrell was manager at the time. He'd, he'd scored the night before. I said, I'm not that happy. I said, why? He said, well, we're off today and we're doing nothing. I said, well, that's the norm, really. And, football and he said well you told us if we're not going forwards we're going backwards we should be doing stuff I was working three times a day with you or so that was a mindset change and uh, yeah we got some great work going with all of them we'd have them around Clive's apartment we'd talk Johnny Wilkinson we'd show them the individual work Johnny did Clive had some trophies that Johnny had won I don't remember which ones they were but they were quite big we'd try to impress them with them we'd say you can be the Johnny Wilkinson of mm. uh, football through hard work but culturally, there was a lot of there was a fair bit of resistance, and I can understand why um, many things that Clive and I were proposing were, were fairly new. I believed in a technical sense on a sort of a man-to-man -man marking type thing. It's pretty much what uh, else that sort of style at Leeds, based on ridiculous levels of fitness. So there was all that type of thing, and I think Clive was redoing the training ground. We were doing that up. But uh, it was a difficult working environment. The sessions I loved, but sometimes the players would say to us, bestie or guy would say, I feel sorry for you two, they're telling us not to listen to you and this, that and the other. It was difficult. And eventually, I think, having what I had at home, I built this empire of soccer schools. I had this club that I'd bought to do serious things with that I just to say got going at Garforth. I could have bought a club slightly higher. I could have at the time got a conference, nearly a conference club in Farsley Celtic or Geisley. I went for Garfield. I thought, this is more of a challenge. I can feed our young players through it. So in a way, Southampton, if it had been interesting to me and I suppose a bit smoother, um, it would have been all right. But I was young, I was ambitious, impetuous. And we've got Harry Redknapp there, lovely man. Dave Bassett, lovely man, but different ways to us. Dennis Wise had come in. And you know, some days it was like a, it was chaos. So um, I've I had suppose enough. you say you're uh, you're t two outsiders in in that football world, like you and Clive, you know, coming from with your different ideas. And as we all know, football is very insular, and you know, not not that open to maybe old dogs knowing new tricks, as it were. Yeah, it was difficult, um, but I learned so much from it. 
Um, if I had my time again, I'd have stuck it out. I met Clive, you know, I was with Clive in London um, maybe a year ago, and maybe maybe two years ago. And we talked about it and all of that type of thing. I'd have probably stuck it out, but I was not a, not a person at the time. I meditate today and I do all sorts of wonderful practices like that. But at the time, I wasn't a guy who could sit still for a minute. And um, hmm. I saw some some of what we were doing there. I just thought we're, we're just kicking our heels here. We, uh, yeah, I, I couldn't see it. Uh, I couldn't see having a happy ending and, and, and wanted to come back to, to, to my own work. I'm interested to know then, how did you upskill yourself on all the individual techniques? You talked about, you know, these, the Brazilian way and the skill techniques. I mean, for me, you know, I was always assessed by a Brazilian foot. My first coaching tracksuit was a Brazilian tracksuit, you know, team tracksuit. Remember it, that, 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 that blue one. But I mean, so, so now, you know, very much I was just mimicking the, the, the skills of the players I loved almost and what I saw on TV, you know, that, those initial things. How did you upskill yourself to... To, to be able to go and work with first team players on technique like Gareth Bale and those guys yeah I think it went back to when I even pre the Brazilian stuff when I first started coaching um, I'm like 23, 24 and taking the kids in school and I in fact go right back to when I was a supporter at Middlesbrough I've got some drawings that I made uh 1980 so I was nine or ten we don't have VHS at the time but Middlesbrough have a number seven it was my favorite player called Terry Cochran from Northern Ireland socks rolled down shirt out step overs little movements like that and I never understood what he'd done to be a player I used to stand think what has he just done and that was my focus of the game waiting for him to do it and a few years ago my dad was a policeman we had these old police diaries where I'd tried to draw it in pen. And when we got video later on, I could slow those movements down. And as a player, I was a skill-based player and a skill-interested player. When I started teaching, I wanted to teach the kids skills like that, effective skills. And so 23, 24, I'd had VHS in the flat that myself and Gillian lived in in Leeds. I'd play things, I'd watch them, and then I'd do them in the sort of living room. We were just in a two bedroom flat at the time, but I'd do them in there. And same when I started Janino and all the Brazilian stuff, I would indoors play the video and spend a few hours learning it myself. And ended up realizing if I can learn this at my age when I'm in, you know, early to mid twenties, how powerful is this gonna be for kids? So everything I did, Later on, whether it was a pass, whether it was whatever it was, I taught myself it first and didn't try to pass it on until I'd, I'd got it and was playing football three times a week. And I suppose in terms of transference, do these isolated skills work? Yes, some of the football I was playing was with good players, but I could put this stuff as a 20, mid 20, you know, then 23, 24, I could put some of it into games. So that fascinated me. So yeah, I made sure I learned it first and I enjoyed learning it. If I wasn't in the house, the place I ended up running the first soccer school, I was down at Roundy Park on my own and got, uh, and would still, you know, I've got a dodgy knee at the minute, but if I had, if I didn't and could run about, I'd still be doing that today. I love, I love being with the ball. It's interesting though, because it's a lot more difficult back then because pre YouTube and you know, internet, all those were accessible and everything's, you know, app, like, you know, those things. So, so as in, you know, what you're just trawling that old footage of games and watching those, you know, as much, much, much of those top players as possible. Yeah, I just would stop the video and I'd look at exactly what they'd done. I'd find another one. I am a obsessive type person, mm. which, you know, at some point, parts of parts of your life, that can be a problem because anything you get into, you're sort of obsessed. But when I studied, I was obsessed with my study and my degree, whatever I get into. And all of my time in football, I'm obsessed with it. I'm obsessed with how to make it better. So it didn't bother me how many videos I had to trawl through. So if I'm doing, you know, a particular Brazil match, I'm stopping every bit and trying to see the part of the foot he's used for that. How do we take that away? use that in an isolated practice how do we use it in a practice where we've got some movement maybe I, I I mean on my first not my first DVD it was my oh thing like that I did 
Michael Owen as a visual thing, one called Gold, G-O-L, and learned to play the Brazilian way, which was really successful everywhere. And I did one with JJ Kocha. On that learn to play the Brazilian way, this was all before YouTube, I walked through stages that I think we need to go through from isolated practice to use it in a game. Okay, first against a cone, then against a still opponent, then a walking opponent, then a then you at a bit of pace. If you do all of that, you trans you transfer everything. But the time it took to learn didn't uh, bother me. But I suppose when you go to Southampton and you're working with them, even the first team, obviously you can do things with the ball, even passing wise, that maybe they can't. And so they get a bit, bit of respect from you straight away because of that. But again, I thought, well. I ain't no great footballer, so if I can learn that, mm. they can, I can pass it on to them. And um, But the older they get, obviously, the less... I used to watch Alan Shearer when I first... Not when I first started, but I don't know what point it was. I used to get so frustrated. If I could just teach him this or that, I could add this to him. I could, mm. you know what I mean? And late, I didn't know Alan Shearer and I was way off his level. But later on, obviously, you get working with players like that. And like you, you, you can pass on these things. Interesting. Do you think like you're, you talked about that, understanding how players or people or children learn? Because do you think it's important that you're you're, te- you're a primary school teacher, right? Is that correct? Same as That's me. Right. I was a primary school teacher. I worked across the uh, age of nothing. That was really important in my coaching and, and my understanding how children learn, not just p- pedagogy, but also just generally you know being that experience of you know. And just and do you think that's why sometimes there's a maybe a difference between the sports science community and maybe the coaching stroke teacher fraternity who have that experience on the ground and maybe they you know because they're talking about oh you know that doesn't transfer or they have maybe haven't had that experience on the ground or in the classroom exactly. it's strange right exactly i'd never thought of it like that i mean you're exactly right i never thought of it in that way um i've been so lucky i think to have the different experiences um my degrees the sport science i'm in with people like that today I'm doing postgraduate stuff at the minute I've got the teaching side back to that young age I've got yeah I've never thought of it that way you're exactly right and maybe that is a reason that people can't see because I just can't understand how you, how you wouldn't well it's interesting because I when you were talking about that you know your Brazilian soccer schools I, I almost had that feeling when we were at Spurs in the early days when we were under Chris Ramsey and John McDermott doing lots of ball mastery in 1v1 like a very Dutch Ajax styles thing, and no one else was really doing that in the country. And the, 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 the you know the, the results we're having were obviously to see with the players, you know, we're upskilling these players. But no one still there was so much resistance to it because people were just it was very un English, very unconventional, you know, getting players on the ball, telling them not to pass, you know, is completely opposite to, you know, and there's certain there's still resistance to that. People say, well, still you know, there's still people fighting against that, even though they can still see the fruits of the labour. Yeah, again, I see some of the debates that you've had on Twitter and things like that. And on some of the points, I think, well, how could anybody even debate you on that? It's, um, But maybe it is people who are just purely sports science and haven't had the, I don't know. But what I've realised in football, and I've been in it now for nearly 30 years, is things, one, I don't get in the debates anymore. And that's one thing. It's, it's nice not to be in them and just sort of guess on with what you're doing and what I'm doing, because... From my, from my side, ramming it down people's throats doesn't... It works to an extent, but you then create all sorts of problems and all sorts of... Yeah. Uh, so I just let whatever be. But I think a lot of it goes in cycles. And, you know, things are accepted, then they're not. And running, running, running has come in and out of fashion in coaching about three times since, since I started. Mm. Then it goes out and it's that we mustn't do any at all and we can't have anything that's not with the ball and this... I think if you get your own methodology and you know you're on solid ground and principles yourself and it's based on practical experience, like saying you at Spurs, when you've seen the results, how, how can you not work that way when you see the changes in the coming young players? Mm. It's interesting. I mean, and also, you know, look, there's many different ways to do things. Football's a you know, sport and, you know, there's many people doing great things in different clubs, I suppose, you know, having a balance. But so what's what's next for you then? You know, you're, you're meditating, so you've managed to sit still here for 50 minutes or whatever you are now. What, what's 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 in the future for you? I mean, you know, what are the next projects for yourself? Well, I just try and focus on today. I probably used to spend too much time looking at the future. In the end, I ended up 
getting myself into a real mess personally, I think in uh, a sort of a mental health point of view. I started drinking like a fish. That took me down. I had built up all this stuff. I think it was really after Southampton uh, all of that started. I'd ended up in a sort of national newspaper uh, battle with Harry Redknapp and different things like that and began a real decline. And in 2012, I sold the soccer schools when I was in terribly bad health and wasn't actually sure at that point even at how much longer I'd, I suppose, live, to be perfectly honest with you. And so I spent a couple of years recovering my health, um, making sure that things were good in my family and all that type of thing and putting that first and slowly came back into work and, but I've ended up working with, with, I suppose, for this stage of my life, what I enjoy, which is working with individuals. So I've got a, a project for younger players called Integer Football, which is um, quite a holistic way to um, approach development and, and coaching. Um, focusing on the person in the main and from that you know if we're trying to move towards football getting the footballer is is uh is easier i'm not explaining myself too too well with that you can maybe ask me more on it in a minute but and in addition to that working with professional players which i've been doing since 2014 and um in a sort of even in a just a helping sense and not in a a formal sense um, but it was that really that got me back into, to, got me back going again. And so, in a more formal setting today, I work with a, a football agency where I mentor all of their players. So that isn't, you know, necessarily doing technical or something like that. Again, in a holistic sense, in a life sense, some of the life experiences that I've had, you know, you can help them through the ups and downs. So I find that very, very fulfilling, as well, also. Fantastic. All right, Simon, thanks very much. It's been, it's been uh, really uh, a fantastic uh, 55 minutes, so I appreciate you uh, coming on. Thanks very much, Saul. Cheers. Thanks for tuning in to the MyPersonalFootballCoach.com Soccer Player Development Podcast. MyPersonalFootballCoach.com's Dynamic Ball Mastery Program is the world's leading online individual technical training program, proven and developed at the highest level in the English Premier League. Sign up now to train like the pros and take your game to the next level. Master the ball, master the game.